Domine participere in et spiritus sancti. Amen. So today we're going to hear about St. Benedict of Norcia. His feast day is March 21st, uh, but he never gets a feast day uh, because he's always in Lent. He probably would have preferred it that way. In any case, um, St. Benedict of Norcia, uh, he is a, a huge figure, not just in the church, but in the, in the world. Uh, he is the father of Western monasticism and one of the patron saints of Europe. Right? Not just the patron saint of a country, but of an entire continent. Um, and he's famous, as, as we should know, for composing the rule of St. Benedict and also the St. Benedict Medal. Uh, so how did all that happen? How did he get started? He was a, um, we'll call it, n not a revolutionary, but an innovator, we'll say. Like the Elon Musk of the 400s, we'll say. Uh, so he was born to a wealthy family in the year 480 in Norcia, Italy. And uh, this is a time of social and cultural upheaval. The Roman Empire was in the midst of collapsing, right? 476, the fall of the Roman Empire. And with that came an influx of bad morals and bad behavior. He was sent to study rhetoric in Rome, which was um, like, the, like the, the thing to study at the time. And um, this might sound familiar. A successful speaker, a successful rhetorician, was not the one who had the best argument or conveyed the truth, but the one who used rhythm, eloquence, and technique to convince the audience. Uh, whether right or wrong, good or evil, it didn't matter. Were you effective? Were you persuasive? That was what they, they, uh, they, they taught with, with rhetoric. Uh, kind of, what is that? Um, relativism. Right? It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong, just are you convincing? That that's your opinion, that's your opinion. Everybody's got opinions, and this is just how to convince people to, to, to follow yours. So this, uh, this did not have a very good um, uh, effect on St. Benedict. He was um, uh, quite distressed at this because he saw very bright young people, uh, young men um, uh, you know, coming in with ability, with wealth, with uh, position, with power, with promise, and then they were ruined with bad morality. Uh, kind of like the combination of like excellent um, potential, excellent education with, with terrible morals. And he saw it just ru ruining their lives and ruining society. So he was just completely disillusioned uh, by this, and um, uh, I don't know whether he finished his studies or not, but, but he left. He left Rome and moved to a smaller village uh, to get away from that big city life, we could say. Um, to find a smaller village where, where things are, are, are better, uh, but they weren't much better in the smaller city either. So uh, he lived for the, there for a few years and then left the village and ended up going to um, a mountainous area, more, more hills, uh, called Subiaco. So just south of Rome, uh, he found this one uh, larger hill, uh, journeyed up and then lived in a cave as a hermit for a number of years. Uh, now there was also another hermit living on that hill, uh, Romulus was, was his name, and he took St. Benedict under his wing, uh, gave him a habit, and taught him, we could say, the rudiments of uh, monastic life, uh, of living as a hermit, and so on. So St. Benedict uh, lived in this manner, giving himself entirely to God, and um, his fame began to spread in the surrounding areas. Not something that he wanted, it just, it just happened that he became to be known as a holy, a holy man, a holy hermit. And then this, is, this gave rise to the um, infamous incident of a, a nearby community of monks who had recently lost their abbot, and they asked St. Benedict to come and take his place, come and be our abbot. And he refused because he knew, like, the way they were living and the way he was living, he's like, this is not going to mix. You, are not, you don't want me to be your abbot. Uh, you're not going to like it. But they continued to beg and, and to ask and to plead, probably because uh, more they wanted the prestige of having St. Benedict as their abbot than actually uh, being edified by his way of life. So he finally uh, uh, um, uh, yield to their desires. He comes and he is, he, he is their abbot, and they, they cannot stand the rigorous, um, or the more rigorous way of life that he had. He had them actually disciplined, uh, regulated their diet, what they ate, what they did, how they prayed, uh, completely uh, not what they wanted. So, of course, they did what, what any community would do when they realized they'd made a mistake. Uh, they tried to kill him, right? They, by poisoning his chalice at mass. You know, just, we'll, just quiet, we'll just quietly solve the problem here. Uh, so that just kind of gives you an idea of how bad things were. So uh, they poisoned his chalice for mass, and when he made the sign of the cross over it, uh, that, that, that metal, you know, heavy chalice uh, split in half, and, and the contents poured out. And for this reason, uh, often Benedict is pictured in, in uh, uh, sacred art 
uh, holding a chalice with a snake coming out of it, right, to indicate that. So, um, I mean, he pretty much realized at that point, uh, okay, I told you this is not a good idea. You, you could have asked me to leave. Um, I guess they kind of did in a way. Uh, so, he, so he left. He, he leaves the monastery, goes back to Mount Subiaco, uh, and this time, uh, rather than go out to monks, uh, they come to him, right? People start coming to him, disciples, and he begins founding uh, small communities, which was, this was a way to do things, right? You would go into the desert and live as a hermit, right? And, and, and men had been doing this for, for um, you know, hundreds of years, uh, with, with St. Paul, the first hermit, uh, uh, St. Hilarion, and, and, and other others. Uh, so, um, uh, St. Benedict, however, takes these groups of men, 12 at a time, after the apostles of our Lord, and he puts them in small communities uh, around these, these mountains. So uh, he's founding these, these um, um, uh, little communities, we could say, and he founds, uh, ends up founding 12 of them, 12 communities of 12 men each, right, 144, very biblical number. Uh, but unfortunately, um, what is it, Satan can't stand that, that good example and always going to try to interfere uh, with a good thing. So this time, uh, it wasn't uh, Benedict who goes to a bad monastery, uh, like a bad monk comes to Benedict. It was Florentius, another monk in the area, who was very jealous and envious of all the attention and the success that St. Benedict was having. Uh, so he tries to poison St. Benedict with a loaf of bread. I don't know why he thought this time would work, but he gets his poisoned loaf of bread, he, he puts it where St. Benedict is going to um, uh, receive it, and uh, when St. Benedict goes to eat it, he makes a sign of the cross over the bread, and a raven comes and snatches the bread away and takes it off. And for this reason, you'll often see that depicted in art as well. So once again, right, that's why you should always say your meal blessings. Right? Always say your meal blessings in public or otherwise, don't forget that. Uh, but his life was saved again, uh, but this time, uh, Fl uh, Florentius, this evil monk, wasn't uh, going to give up and hired, uh, we would say, women of ill repute to go among the monks, the different uh, monastic communities there, and try to seduce them. And that was the last straw for St. Benedict. He, he, could, he could take attempts on his life, that was fine, you, you can try to kill me, but don't mess with the souls of my monks, right? If, 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 that, if that's going to happen, I'm leaving. So, so he did. He left Mount Subiaco after many years. Uh, but as always, God brings good out of evil, and St. Benedict went from uh, Subiaco to, uh, to um, Monte Cassino, right, that famous and first Benedictine monastery. And this is where he showed his innovation. Right? This is revolutionary at the time, if we could use that word, in that monastic communities were either, you were either hermits, or it was small communities of, of a couple, you know, a few or a dozen or whatever it may be. St. Benedict uh, founded a, a, a large monastery. Where, where all these monks came together and lived in a large community. This, this really hadn't been done, and they needed a rule of life uh, to keep them uh, orderly. Uh, St. Benedict had the, the benefit of, and so he did, this is where the rule of St. Benedict comes from. Now, he, wasn't, he didn't just invent this out of nowhere. He used uh, two sources at least. One was St. Uh, John Cassian, who was an Eastern monk, who had written kind of a rule uh, for, for, for monks, more like a way of life. And then similarly, it's called uh, a, a work called The Rule of the Master. And that was, again, um, a kind of collections of writings and sayings on how to live as a monk. Uh, the idea that the monastic life is a school from which the monk learns from Christ. So St. Benedict draws upon all these things and he writes up uh, a summary, which is called The Rule of St. Benedict. And there's a testament to the brilliance of this work uh, in that it has lasted for over 1,500 years, uh, virtually unchanged. Uh, you know, monks still use this rule. Benedictines still use this rule, and it works. It is suited to human nature. And, and th this is why, this is how God works in our lives, in, in that he uses everything, everything that happens to us, good or evil, ha happens for a reason. So the, the, the rule was very well written because of his experiences at Rome, his, his rhetoric and education that he had received. Very well written, very astute. But also, if you're going to write a rule for a, a community of men, St. Benedict knew just how bad monasteries could be. He had been in one where they tried to kill him. Uh, he'd seen that even, even good men who want to give their lives from God can go astray. They can be corrupted over time. He knew the evil in human hearts, even in a monastery. So he wrote into this rule uh, both uh, guidelines for the good and to prevent the bad, which he knew was possible. 
Uh, so very, very astute, very uh, uh, well done by St. Benedict to write a document that lasts 1,500 years through different cultures, different times, different eras, different epochs, uh, different uh, levels of, of um, what you call it, uh, um, um, technological availability. The fact that it has lasted this long is a testament that uh, human nature doesn't change. And St. Benedict knew human nature, right? Definitely guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but this, again, it was, it was revolutionary in that this really hadn't been done before. And we take it for granted, like, oh, go, go join a, a, a convent or a monastery, you know, go be a monk or a nun. Those didn't exist. If you wanted to do, to do something like that, you had to go out in the desert and, and basically live, live in a cave or, you know, with the straw and the rain and the wind. You had to be tough to, to live like that. And St. Benedict uh, made it available even to the weaker members, those whose physiology, uh, you know, their, their health wasn't so good. Now they had a place where they could give themselves over to God. They had a place to, to um, you could say, retreat from a crumbling world. I think this is, this is where that, that famous book going around a few years ago, The Benedict Option, right? This is who it's named after, is St. Benedict, who left behind a corrupt society and, and founded a retreat, a monastery uh, for, for men and women who wanted to escape because his sister, St. Scholastica, she did for women what, what Benedict was doing for the men there at, at the base of Mount Monte Cassino. So um, uh, this is where he lived out the rest of his life, um, uh, you know, writing the rule and, and help developing with the, uh, these, um, uh, this, this monastery, this way of living. And he uh, had his, his uh, motto, Ora et Labora, pray and work. In that the, the, by these two means, uh, mankind gave everything back to God, right? The, the mind uh, by um, intellectual study, by reading, uh, the soul by prayer, the Psalms, chanting the office, the Holy Mass, and then the body uh, by work, by labor. And it was this model that transformed and, and terraformed Europe. It was, it was the monasteries, primarily the Benedictine monasteries, that went into the swamps and the deserts and the mountains and the inhospitable places in Europe and turned them into gardens turned them into um, farmland, turned it into places that produced, you know, grapes and, and, and corn and wine and oil and so on, and bees and wax. Uh, that's what they did for Europe. There was a, there was a book, um, was it how, how the Catholic Church built Western civilization, um, and talks about uh, how these men would go into these places and they, they would work themselves to death. Uh, these were inhospitable. They, there was bad conditions, uh, poor living, but these monks would go and they would give their lives for Christ, terraforming the land, and at the end of it, uh, Europe was able to enjoy uh, the fruits of their labor, right? The poor persons. At one point in, in, in Belgium, there was a monastery, and this, this is much later on, you know, in the, the 1200s, 1350s, I don't know. Uh, but this, this monastery would feed 600 poor people every day. It would give every, every single poor person a loaf of bread and a, a pint of beer, which, you know, wasn't so good back then, not as good as it sounds. Uh, but that, that's what these monasteries would end up doing for Europe. And it was St. Benedict who started it. Uh, so, you know, this is, this, we have, this is really incredible what, what God can do with just one life, right? But it wasn't, it wasn't just one. It wasn't St. Benedict. He was drawing upon the men who had come before him and other writings and other persons. But this is how God likes to work, is, is he uses many people to accomplish his designs. Uh, but every single one has a reason and a purpose, right? What if St. Benedict hadn't followed his call? What, what if he had fled from God? Actually, that, that's apropos of today's uh, Lenten readings, which is uh, a Jonah preaching to Nineveh. And he ran. Jonah ran away from his vocation. What if Benedict had done that? Or what if Benedict's parents had run away from their vocation to marriage and they had never had him in the first place? So we just don't know. We don't know what the future has or what God has in store for us, but we just must simply get into our minds, whatever God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I want. Because good or bad, whether people are, my monks are trying to kill me or they're coming in trying to seduce other monks or whether the society is bad, the society is falling apart, whether I had a good education or bad education, God will use it for his purposes in the long run. That's, that really has to be my only desire, is doing what God wants me to do. And what is God's will for me? What's happening to me right now? Right? Whatever's happening to me, good or bad, that's God's will that I deal with it well. I don't let fortune uh, uh, corrupt me. I don't let misfortune, um, would say, uh, depress, right, or make me bitter. Uh, so St. Benedict would end up um, uh, uh, dying in the year uh, 547. He was 67 years old on 21 March, uh, which was yesterday. This always occurs in Lent. Uh, so let us um, uh, thank God for having given us St. Benedict, the example of his holiness, uh, the monasteries he founded, the convents, you know, founded by his sister Scholastica. 
and ask God that we may imitate his virtues, his desire to serve God, his desire to take everything, good and bad, and turn it to good and give it back to God and to his fellow man. Uh, St. Benedict, pray for us. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.